Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk on the, the gluteal flaps. Um, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Erica, for allowing me to present uh, my, my interest in um, breast reconstruction in more slim patients. Um, I usually start, but like in all of you do, you start uh, the process with the consultation. I like to start with a, a very standardized uh, consultation, where especially I also focus if somebody is interested in autologous reconstruction on what are the donor sites available. And um, uh, you can classify the donor sites accordingly to what is available and to what is not available in order to give the best choice um, to the patient. When I assess them, I look always from the front, and there I not only focus about how much volume is available, but especially as well, how is the pliability of the tissue and how I will be able to give also good donor sites. So if the front is not available, I turn the patient to the back, and then I look for um, other areas. The, the main point is always that volume can be easily corrected, but the bad donor site cannot be easily corrected. So looking at the thigh flaps, you can as well look at from the back and see if there's any availability. And if not, you move further up and you look at the gluteal flaps. Again, there too, it's not about the volume, it's about how pliable the tissue is, whereby you could get a good um, donor site if you use the gluteal flaps for a reconstruction. Because what you want to avoid is a high riding scar, like in this patient here. So therefore you need to do everything possible to avoid this high riding scar in a breast reconstruction from the abdomen. So the gluteal flap as such has had a lot of bad reputation because people say it looks like a shark bite, it would cause significant asymmetry, and there are cultural issues. I know, you know, in South America is not the most favorite place to take, um, uh, to put the scar. And, um, and as well, it's the impossibility to almost shape the, uh, the flap and also because of high rate of failure. I will try to address all of this issue in order to demonstrate that the gluteal flap is a good option in breast reconstruction for patients who would benefit from this type of reconstruction. So the most first important thing you know, to avoid the shark, shark type look is where you will position the island. So the island you can position many different uh, ways in order, but you know, to avoid the side effects, you have always to think of it's a reconstruction where you can also put in cosmetic parts of it where it would be like a gluteal lift. We know from the anatomy where to position it. So you will um, look for the posterior uh, elect spine, you look for the trochanter, you look for the coccyx, and then you will know more or less where most of the perforator will be lying. Here, this is the piriformis muscle, and most of the perforators will be lying above the piriformis muscle, and there's lots of them there. So therefore, you can position your island in any direction, but most of the important is that it has to be a good cosmetic result. So again, you, you feel where the, where, where the best tissue is and how you could position the flap, and then you will start to mark. Is it now more horizontal? Is it now with a tilt? Because in all these areas, there will be perforators. I used to use the MRI scan or CT scan to locate the perforator, but what I would realize that it would more, first of all, there was always perforators, so it would not give you much of information. It's always an intramuscular course, which is by definition the case of a perforator flap. And most of it, it will then lead me that I will more position the flap around the perforator and hence getting a bad look um, of the donor's pre-operative MRI scan, CT scan, because it's unnecessary. So here in the short video where you can see the preoperative marking and the perforators mapping. So um, I start with the patient in the, in the standing position where I look again where I should mark the, 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 the flap. You can see here, so I first mark the, the draw from the coccyx and I go down to the piece and I connect them and that will give me where I should locate the perforators. And based on the location of the perforators, which I use a handheld Doppler, and the handheld Doppler for the gluteal flap is excellent because it really gives you a very precise location of the perforator. And once you have marked them, then you can draw the line around your skin island. 
In a delayed reconstruction, you have to think as well about which side you're going to take the flap from, left breast, uh, contralateral or ipsilateral, depending on how you want to design your flap. Therefore, the shaping, you start by thinking of it before you, you, you start with taking a knife in your hand. So in which part you want to position more the skin island and where you need the volume for superior pull. And when you've got the flap out, then you know that your donor side will be fine. And when I raise the flap, I usually start with chamfering uh, the flap so that I will give more fat tissue out and do the skin island more smaller. If I don't need too much skin, I will not take too much skin. So the initial carving is important and I take my time to do this carving so I get the maximum volume of fat and it's not gonna be a sharp dissection straight down because that's again will lead to this, um, to this shark type style. The dissection itself, it's, it's a subfascial uh, dissection. So you go to the muscle, you incise the muscle and you dissect it subfascially. And you can see here the way I do it, I use a diathermy where I hold the flap in one hand then I curve it all the way in so that I um, all the time are dismantling the paramecium until I reach the perforator. And if you keep to this plane very strictly, the perforator will come to you and you don't have to, to be too nervous that you will not find the perforator. Once you see the perforator, then you can also use the scissors if you want and you can just open up the paramecium and you will get a very plain um, dissection. And once I have the perforator, then I change my instrument and I will continue the dissection with the bipolar and I keep the bipolar on 20, um, so it's fairly high, but you have to stay away from it. And you can see what I do here. I all the time, I pull and then I bipolarize the paramecium. And by doing so, you will see the nice side branches, which you can take away and you can open up the plane nicely and the, the perforator will develop itself very easily. The further down you go, then it's also important that you tell your nieces is to give good um, relaxation so that it doesn't pull too much towards you. Now in this case, it was very particular because it has two perforators. So here you can see the perforator and the dissection. And once you dissect it further out, you can hold the, the skin away so it doesn't fall into your space and kind of obstructing your view to the perforators. And you need to always um, fix the flap as well because especially if it's the side position, it doesn't fall into you. So you can raise the flap very nicely without further assistance. Again, I think this is the most important part. That's why I stress so much to it. Open up the fascia, open up the muscle in a very long length, the entire length, so you don't compromise yourself from the view. And then you can use retractors where you're gonna hold the, the muscles away and gonna lead you down in which direction the perforator goes. So the further down you go, the more you're gonna use on both sides retractors, so you go further down and down. Then once I have identified the perforator, then I will go all the way around it. I stay in the subfascial plane so that, uh, so that the flap is only left with the one single perforator. Because your perforator is half dissected out, nothing more will happen to you. But if in order that you get better uh, visuality of your, per, of your pedicle, you need to cut the perforator, uh, the, the flap all the way around. Otherwise, it will be difficult that you can see the flow of, um, of your pedicle. Here, so I use the retractors, I put them nicely in, and I will take, really split the muscle apart. And then, um, and like this, I will continue dissecting all the way down, 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 until I reach a fascia. Once you reach that fascia, you have to continue your dissection. You can see here. So on this plane, you can see that I have reached the fascia, I have opened the fascia, and what comes next? It's a big amount of fat tissue. And this fat tissue is all the way around the pedicle, so I usually use a, dissect, uh, a suction device. And once I, with the suction device, then I can completely like do almost a lipectomy of the pedicle in order to continue going down. So this is opening of the fascia. It's a very firm fascia, and you have to very coagulate it very superficially until it opens up. And once it opens up, then you see the whole branching of your pedicle going in all different directions. Make sure again here too, the patient is well relaxed so you can open it up and you can see what's happening. 
the, one of the big mistakes one can do in a, in a SCAP flap is that you limit yourself in the dissection, then you get a lot of bleeders, and with a lot of bleeders means that you will not have the visuality. So this is what I'm doing here with the suction device. I'm doing a lipectomy. I'm opening up the pedicle by just suck, sucking away the fat before continuing with the dissection. Here you can see the plane of, this, of the dissection. You can see this fascia, opening up the fascia, and then you continue down. Do not stop your dissection before that fascia. You need to reach that fascia, you need to open that fascia in order to continue your dissection. Then comes the problem, comes this caput medusa, and you, then comes always a discussion which direction you should go, which one is the main branch, which one is the side branch, and you need to follow them, and you need to just to as well understand the anatomy, how it goes. It doesn't go laterally, it goes medially. So you need to open this up. I like to use at this stage the microscope because with the microscope it shows me much nicer how the pedicle is running and I will make less mistakes. Um, you can see here with the microscope now I can uh, free up the pedicle, I can look really for the branching, I can clean the vessels under the microscope, you have a good vision, you have good light and I can clean nicely the end, the last centimeter of the pedicle dissection I can do it um, with this, uh, with the bipolar. And avoiding small bleeders. Like here, even though I'm really under good vision, you can always get a small amount of bleeders, but you have to be careful, it's not too much. Once I'm happy, then I can make a big clips on it and I can disconnect the flap. You can see here another, di another dissection, you see the pedicle going down, the pulsation of the pedicle, and you have reached here the end of it. You don't need to go any further. But what you know, that you have a nice size vein, nice size artery, and you can clean them under the microscope. This is all dissection under the microscope. Once you disconnect the flap, then comes the shaping. First thing I do, I take the flap onto a side table and I clean the vessels again on the microscope one more time. I will start shaping the flap, I will depetalize it, and I will put the flap then also into it in order to clean it. So you can see here, I start to carve away too much which is not needed uh, because I checked that before. I will then start depetalizing it. I will clean the flap under the microscope. Um, so really I'm preparing here the flap before starting the, the, the microsurgical part. The, and in the meantime, somebody else can close the buttocks and you use as well a drain for closing the buttocks so, so that you will have a, um, a nice closure of the backside. So once the flap is completely depetalized and ready for transfer, I put it back again into the pocket and check that the shape of the breast looks fine. So here the flap is completely ready. It is depetalized, it, uh, the vessels under the microscope, you can see here, I'm cleaning them so that when I make the transfer to the chest, I, have, I can start straight with anastomosis and I don't have to do anything more. So this part I, as well, I do it on and off table. I like to flush the pedicle. I, I use heparin saline, which I flush the pedicle through, through the artery, and I flush it as much until I see there is the backflow from the vein coming, and then I'm happy. Here you can see the positioning. This is, uh, this is the buttock side. This is the length of the pedicle. And now I put the flap on the chest. I shape it, and this is where I know where the pedicle will go for the internal mammary vessels. I fix the flap, and this is now important. Because you have a thick flap, and you have a short pedicle of maximum eight centimeters, it's important that you put the flap towards you, and not like a Dieppe flap on the side. In a Dieppe flap, you have a longer pedicle, and you have a sh less amount of thickness of fat, so you can put it easily on the side. But with an s you have to put The usual time for these procedures for unilateral would take about three to three and a half hours. For a bilateral is five to five and a half hours. And these are some clinical results. A uh, patient with a nipple spraying mastectomy. Here I used uh, a hammock over, uh, superior from the nipple. You can see here the monitor island, which afterwards I removed. Here, a patient for a bilateral uh, nipple spray mastectomy. Here is a medial incision, which I don't use anymore, and the buttocks donor side. 
And here another patient with a longer scar, but the length of the scar is not important. The reason why I show this is that the shape of the buttocks is important where positioning. So once is lower, once is higher, there are many different areas that you can put the, the incision in. Here now a, a patient with a skin spray mistake to me. The question comes always with how can we change the volume of the, of the S-cap? Um, extensive lipofilling, yes. Yes, augmentation by implant, no, by particular flaps, no. So the only way you can do it, you can give more in order to do it with extensive lipofilling. Like in this patient here, she had a bilateral skin spray mastectomy, bilateral escap flaps, liposuction of the thighs, lipofilling of the breast in order to get an improvement of the buttocks and, and, uh, and a better shape of the breast. Um, and lastly, as well, I want to announce that the London Breast Meeting this year will not happen. Instead, we have converted as well to webinars, but especially we have created this new platform, which is called ARPS Network. And um, there are all the videos of all the previous uh, London Breast Meetings are on it. There are almost something around 200 videos soon. There is a big faculty on it. So join. It's, um, you can join right now by going onto the website and um, and putting your details in, and you can also connect with other doctors. It's very interactive, so you can be very useful if you're in training. And uh, thank you very much, and I hope that you will have some questions for me, and I'm sure that the other speakers, which were also talking about breast reconstruction on skin and skinnier patients, will be joining and discussing about the results. Thank you very much.